history, it's me and Danny of Deljabar. What's up, man? How are you? You're wearing a mask, like you're, me. You're wearing a mask. <laughs> We're both wearing masks. For attention. Um, <laughs> I'm taking this shit off. <laughs> All right. um, I thought of something funny. What's up? So, I'm sure people are still, like, you know, dating a little bit, right? Like, I, I, know, I know people who are single who are, are meeting other people. Through, like in like, person? Yeah, like they're they're still dating and they're meeting people through like whatever online app they use. Okay, that's and they're going foolish. on they're they're going on walks. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Go just if you're young. I don't see. I don't think it's I that mean, big I, of a deal. I thought that people were going to start plenty, like there's... getting into like cyber sex or some shit like that. <laughs> that's maybe, what I think. Maybe I think the majority of people are just turning into incels. <laughs> Everyone's so, an incel. Self, self-created incels but um people are like dating uh, and they're going on walks and stuff but i bet they're wearing masks so imagine you know how girls will be like oh but like when i met him he was wearing a hat but then he took it off and i found out he was bald <laughs> or like, like in his, <laughs> or like he was sitting down and I, he was just really short or something like that right it's gonna be like a bunch a wave of like oh my god he took his mask off he yeah, the, like an ogre. Yeah, he had the most had janky penis. teeth everywhere. <laughs> he had a penis on his nose. <laughs> it was right out of his face. Um, but yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe do what that. you got to do, but like you know, do it six feet apart from one another. <laughs> do your part six feet apart. Ha <laughs> ha. Do your part six feet apart. If someone else says that to me, I'm going to jump off a bridge. To me is everyone's got to do their part to maintain this, so we can get back to normalcy. And the new normal, if, if someone else refers to this as the new normal, I'm going to jump off a bridge. It and is the new normal <laughs> a high bridge? Is well, like a very high bridge. Um, I cannot stand the like political lingo or the camaraderie lingo that that's going around due to COVID nineteen, like. Everyone stay safe. Do your part. Uh, leave them alone. Leave smart. them alone. It's I'm there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's 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 lame. You have to admit that it's it's lame when someone says, "Do your part, six feet apart." <laughs> it's not lame because it's reinforcing positive like interactions. Sure, but when day. someone echoes it, it's just it it grinds. It my, might be like. It, it might be like annoying at this point because you've heard it so much, and I like that I can concur with, but like it's it's not lame. It's just it's the worst is uncertain. Of it. <laughs> now that we're living in uncertain times, <laughs> now that we live in uncertain times, we need to up- accept the new normal. I mean, you're caged like an animal. If ever there were an uncertain time, I feel like it would be now, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess. How are you doing? I'm I'm fine. I'm doing great. Uh, thank God, of course. You know, I'm still working, still still kicking, healthy. You know, hasn't touched that's anyone in my family or anything like that. So I'm very 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 happy about that. How about you? That's that's good to hear. Yeah, the same man. I haven't been. I haven't. You know, got the virus. Oh, who knows if I have it or not? But we might have had it. <laughs> I, anyone anyone could have had it at this point. Yeah. Uh, but in reality, I mean, I'm not doing so great. I'll be completely honest. Like, I fucking hate this shit. I hate it. Um, (laughs) It's not fun to stay in your home all day. It's it's not like I. It's not fun, especially when it's getting beautiful outside right now. Yeah, it'll be very very hard to stay indoors for that. Yeah, in New York. So some people are going on going out and saying like. You know, people in New York are locked in their houses and they can't go outside and they can't walk around. In New York, you can walk outside. No yeah. one's going to – you're not going to be arrested if you walk around. Nope. You're allowed to go to parks. Yep. There was a picture of um, – th- there was a park down by in the West Village, Greenwich Greenwich Village area, like right by uh, like Pier 4 uh, downtown. And there was a bunch of guys – in speedos like out tanning together and people are like oh my god look at new york like people aren't social distancing and it was it was pretty funny because it looked like a picture of europe it kind of did yeah it it looked very 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 european yeah 
I wish but I should have I should have pulled was, that picture up for this. <laughs> I mean, it was in re, it was Greenwich Village, and there's a lot of gay people who live in Greenwich Village, and that's um, I mean, that's why they were wearing that. But it's it's interesting um, that people are saying that you can't like, and they're kind of coming up with this uh, this narrative that like we're under a complete lockdown here. Like we we you know we're, we're we have some freedom of movement. Oh, we have total freedom of movement. It's yeah, not like we, go, we, go, in, we can go in the grocery stores. Yeah, I mean, in other states like New Jersey, where my mom is at right now, you know, she's they have a curfew. They have like a, I think it's like an eight or a nine p.m. curfew where you can't go outside afterwards. That's so stupid. Yeah. Like, why? Why would you implement a curfew? Like, what? Wouldn't you want people to go outside at different parts of the day? Like, I typically don't. I, I usually leave my place after eight p.m. Mm-hmm. when it's less crowded. Mm-hmm. Like, that's when I'll go work out. Like okay. that's when I'll I that's when make, I'll go for a bike ride. I didn't make the rules, but you know, the the rule seems really stupid, and it just seems to be a rule for the sake of saying I have a rule, I have a curfew. Like that makes no sense because then you're forcing people to go out during the day when more people are out instead of having people go out at different times. So it, it there's less like a, traffic. It might just be like a police manpower kind of thing. It know? just might, it might just be that New Jersey is a police state. Like <laughs> you ever go through New Jersey, like even before COVID, yeah, I grew up in New Jersey. Should have it. I grew yeah, up in yeah, New Jersey. You're from New Jersey. What am yeah. I talking about? But I've always felt uneasy, um, traveling through New Jersey <laughs> with their cops. They are Dude, we, we have the way most... more likely to give you a speeding ticket there. <laughs> Cops are way more they're they're more aggressive. They're bigger <laughs> assholes. Dude, you, um, you gotta you gotta understand that laws. you have to understand that we have more people per square mile than anywhere in the country by a lot. So... We gotta control those those crazy Italians over there. It's so <laughs> funny. It but like you can't pump your own gas in New Jersey. For the same reason. It's, it's because we have more people just, per square mile than anywhere else in the country by a lot. What, what and everybody has a car. Ev- everybody has the- a car. Like it, it would be like gas theft all the time. It would be like safety issues all the time. Not to mention it's much more efficient when you have a person pumping your gas for you because people don't, do- go, do you- people don't dawdle. They just go. You're the most densely populated state, but there's more densely populated like areas and counties in the U.S. that you can pump your own gas. Yeah, but that's like a microcosm. This is across the entire state. It's a I, I did that. I don't understand how that how you correlate that. I feel like it's something to do with. Dude, it's it's, he- it's, health, it's safe. Water. It's a safety concern. It's honestly I, a safety I concern. I, I, don't, I don't. Plus, I don't. Get, you, know, you hate on it, but. Where have you seen like self-service gas? St- oh, not self-service gas stations, like full-service gas stations anywhere else in the country, and it's like freezing cold outside, and somebody comes up to your window and says how much you want, and then you just get to chill in your toasty car, and then they do it for you. It's pretty great. What if I want to stop at a gas station real quick, get out, pump my gas, and get the fuck out of here, and not wait on a long line because some guy's like taking his time squeegeeing my my window and all that stuff. I guess I'm making it sound a little bit nicer. Yeah, well, right what now. if, what if you put right. what, what if you pull up to a gas station and there's 12 people just dicking around at the pump and you need to get your gas and go and you know, they're just taking their sweet ass time and now you got to wait. Well, I guess in that case, that would be a value proposition for that gas station to have someone help you, but you shouldn't not be allowed. You shouldn't force the owner of the gas station or the company to hire somebody or prevent someone from freely that's cre- it's creating jobs, man. Pump. It's creating jobs. You know, yeah, I, I pump gas at, of, at one juncture. Creating jobs for the sake of creating jobs is is not productive. It's we also waste. have some of the most expensive gasoline too. <laughs> so, you know. yeah, it, it just makes it makes the gas trip more expensive. But all right, enough. Most, enough. <laughs> we have the most enough. expensive car insurance. Yeah, all things about cars in New Jersey just just doesn't really work out very well. So every and then like they're rules on beaches and stuff like hey they're somebody, reopening them. i have it they're, they're, they're private re- no prior though i'm talking about like mm. there's so many like beaches that are like uh like public beaches that you can't go on at certain times and i don't yep. know i fuck don't i'm not i'm not a fan <laughs> i'm not a i'm not a fan of the of the jurors jersey's a police state according no to i like i like jurors a lot of my <laughs> best friends are actually from new jersey um and i always i always make fun of them a lot. <laughs> uh, and I spent a considerable amount of time in New Jersey as well mm-hmm. uh, throughout my life. 
Um, love the people, don't like the rules. Um, actually, no, I don't love the people. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> hey, you gotta be I careful. I like the people I know, but everyone else that I've met there. Good portion uh, of our listener base is in New Jersey, so you gotta be nice. <laughs> that's good, that's good. No, but most people from New Jersey who are probably listening to this probably agree. They're like, yeah, <laughs> fucking Jersey. Like, Fuck Jersey. For the most part, suck. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, this suck. All right, no, let's move on from New Jersey. Um, I think we had enough. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we were thinking about talking about today. So I guess we will, uh, I don't know, where do you want to start this, this show up? Because we were going to talk about, uh, things involving, uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, and also things involving China to follow up our, our previous episode. So I guess in the spirit of it, we should start out with the China stuff because we ended that our, you know, the last episode was about China so we can have a continuation and then we'll we'll move into uh you know the the stuff to do with uh the Jordan Valley yeah for sure so um a couple things happening right now are on the COVID front for China um I mean among many things you know China right now is ramping up their military and their navy we were talking about that at the end of last uh episode there um they're actually planning on doing a military drill very soon uh that simulates um capturing a Taiwanese island, uh, like an island that's owned by Taiwan. Um, So that's uh, pretty interesting. I mean, we've been sending our warships over there to like, you know, flex our our dick muscles and and they've been doing the same. So tensions are rising really high. But I think right now what's the biggest news is is probably all of the, you know, uh, uh, lawsuits that are happening right now. So uh, apparently a bunch of states and some companies are, you know, setting themselves up to sue China. Um, so as an example, Missouri, uh, as, as well as a few other states, uh, have decided specifically to sue China um, over the mishandling of the health crisis. Um, so that, that happened last month. Um, and they the, the lawsuit contains uh, the quote, lying to the world about the danger and contagious nature of COVID-19. Uh, Mississippi, a day later, uh, decided to prep, prepare for the same um, for the same lawsuit. So, like, a, suddenly, you know, a lot of this anti-China talk is is materializing into actual like legal action, and it kind of raises a bunch of interesting questions about like the you know the the sovereignty rule. Like, can you sue a sovereign state? You know, uh, as an entity. Um, you know, and I guess maybe I can ask of, of your opinion on it. Like, how do you feel about states suing China? Uh, for COVID-19. Well, what makes it complicated is that you have sovereign immunity because it's if it's almost impossible to have a neutral court from one state to right. another. Like if you're cooking up a lawsuit in the U.S., right? Um, like how how does China have a fair how trial or mm-hmm. vice versa? Like China, we wouldn't have a fair <clears throat> trial in China, right? So it, it, that that's that's the the line the, the thin line. But people want to, I guess people want payback. Uh, they want they restitution. Want to mitigate, yeah. They want restitution and they want to mitigate the losses that they've received due to our lockdown. Mm-hmm. So um, wh- what's interesting is that, so the way that people are getting compensated for the most part, as we talked about, are, are through, it's through, you know, the Federal Reserve printing more money and the banks and, and then these and loans going out to uh, businesses as far as like small business loans as well as just stimulus checks and stuff like that. Right. Um, other people, I mean, that's supposed to really just hold over the people who've lost their jobs due to the, uh, due to not working at a place that's considered an essential business. Uh, but other companies are getting PPP loans as well who may have just showed their, closed their doors uh, temporarily uh, and, and people are working, it, people who may have closed their doors Physically, but people are still working from home. Um, the the other way that I guess business owners plan to get compensation from this was through their insurance companies, through business interruption claims. But mm-hmm. the 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 issue with that is that that's on a case by case basis. So they're not. Most insurance plans don't have, you know, pandemic as insurance a, as like a, as, as something that's insured within it's like the policy. rain insurance or something like that or fire insurance theft insurance 
pandemic. But the majority of the majority of business owners, they have some type of insurance policy for a business, a business interruption insurance policy uh, that is usually like floods or hurricanes or weather. Acts or of volcano. God. Yep. Volcano insurance. Mm -hmm. You ever see the family guy when Peter is like duped into buying volcano insurance? <laughs> no, I didn't see that specific uh, episode, but. But yeah, they get it for that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, technically, you know, a government lockdown due to a pandemic doesn't cover it. But, you know, the insurance, I, I, that's going to be on like on a policy by policy basis. So I'm sure I'm sure some insurance companies have loose, uh, you know, looser policies that can be interpreted in court a certain way. So they'll probably have to pay up if they're sued, which they will be sued. But uh, other than that, I mean, people are getting paychecks. Democrats want to give more money. Uh, they're talking about the two thousand dollars a month. I I think there's a bunch of different um, numbers floating around. There's, there's the, the, I know it's a three Trump floated money. the idea of five thousand dollars if you defer your social security. Really? Yeah. There's said um, you can like take out a five thousand dollar loan out of your social security and just like you just wait a few more months to get social security. Really? Yeah. Um, what I saw, I saw, I forgot what who suggested this. I wish I had this in my notes on top of mine, but, uh, one of the issues with a lot of workers, a, a lot of business owners is that, th uh, their employees are making more money through the, their unemployment insurances mm -hmm. than they would working. So they can't get them back at their, you can't get them back in the office. Right. So, uh, somebody suggested that you pay people money to go back to work. So they would be paid an additional four hundred dollars mm -hmm. in addition to their salary or to whatever they job. make and pay to get to get a, to get a job. Mm -hmm. So I guess the justification is that it would be it would end up being cheaper than it would be uh, to, to take just unemployment. Mm -hmm. So you mean it, it would be better than taking unemployment? It would because... be less. It would be cheaper for the government right. to just to pay people to go back to work so people don't settle uh with with unemployment because they're making more money there's no incentive to go back to work especially when you know you're, you're probably not going to be doing all too much i guess it really just depends on the business but i mean that, that would uh, only really work if the if the entirety of the economy like opened up again you know because i don't think the, i don't you think know that like the, the incentive could be there i mean could, the incentive could be there but like if you happen to work at i don't know fucking some sector of the economy that requires you to be in close proximity with a bunch of other people that has been deemed unessential, <laughs> you know, like then you can't technically go back to work yet. So it doesn't matter if the incentive is there for you to go back to work. Um, but I mean, I kind of bringing this back to China though, you know, cause like a lot of this, you know, um, about how do we recoup all this money, you know, businesses, you were talking about businesses taking out loans and, you know, uh, suing their insurance companies potentially over like uh, uh, business interruption uh, insurance and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of states and a lot of entities are now looking to get after China for, you know, for some damages and, and claims against them. And uh, one thing that was floating around, which was pretty interesting, you know, that I've been hearing a lot is is this idea that maybe, you know, China holds a bunch of our debt, right? We have a bunch of Chinese debt and bonds, like we should just like say, oh, no, we're not going to pay those anymore and like, make those go away. Um, well, I found this really interesting article. Uh, it was talking about a company called the Lewisburg, uh, which is a Tennessee based American bondholder foundation. And apparently, the Lewisburg, they hold a lot of Chinese debt, like so the other way around. So they have bonds of Chinese debt backed by gold. Um, and <laughs> this is crazy. The debt is over 100 years old. So Apparently, this d these bonds that they purchased uh, were purchased from the ousted imperial government um, uh, as far back as 1912, uh, and they were eventually defaulted on in 1938, but they still have it open. Like, they still have this bond money. Now, those bonds were originally issued to the Republic of China, uh, who, got, who got booted, obviously. Uh, and the government, the Republic of China government actually fled to Taiwan and they're in Taiwan now. And that was, uh, after Mao kicked them out. Um, and that was around 49 or so, something like that. Um, and basically if you account for all of the interest, uh, that accrues for these bonds, 
it amounts to $1.6 trillion in Chinese debt. So this company, the Lewisburg, is thinking about going after them, and they're they're looking to the you know United States to see how they can help them collect on this debt of $1.6 trillion. Evidently, also, this one random company, the Lewisburg, isn't the only people who have you know, this debt, apparently there's up to $6 trillion just kind of all over the world in debt outstanding from these bonds that were created like a hundred years ago. So kind of brings up like an interesting question, you know, um, about, about bonds themselves and, and the debts that we owe, not only just China, but other, other people as well, who, who have, uh, our debt, who've taken on our debt and, you know, whether or not, these things are enforceable in the first place. What do you think about that? Well, if first, first of all, if the U.S. defaulted on their loans to China, or if China thought the U.S. was going to do that, they would dump all their bonds immediately. Like if they even had a hinkling that the U.S. was about to do that, I don't mm-hmm. think the. And also, that kind of devalues the dollar because then less countries would want to invest in the U.S. or lend to the U.S. because they'd be like, well, they defaulted on China. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. they just defaulted. Well, it looks so like China would defaulted make it, it would on make us. It, so. it, would make, it, it would make it less likely that they would want to pay them back. But th- defaulted on us, according to these loans 100 years ago? Yeah, to these I bonds mean, 100 years ago. According to well, international even... law, according to international law, like new governments assume the debt of previous governments. And that's that's been true. Like if, if the United States suddenly broke up, you know, if we had like a civil war part two and, uh, you know, we had like two countries, like the debt that the United States has just doesn't disappear. It it becomes assumed by the, the, the government that takes over afterwards. So they still owe us the money, or at least they owe this one company, the Lewisburg, $1.6 trillion. I find it hard to believe that they're ever going to get it, but, you know, it makes me think, like, critically about whether or not, you know, these these debts on bonds are actually enforceable and, and you know, what the implications of, of not having them. Because couldn't we just dump these bonds as well and, like, fuck with their um, currency? Couldn't we do the same? Well... I don't know how that works. To be completely honest, I don't, <laughs> do I, I don't know. Open I question. don't know. I have I have zero clue what the legal proceeding is from what from one government to another. Because, I mean, the People's Republic of China was founded in in 1949. So, this the current government in place was was founded wasn't a It was established way after China when it was basically like some fucking puppet state like China before World War Two was just a kind of a puppet state to Western powers like it was colonized and treated like garbage by first the first you know the British and the French and the Germans and then by the Japanese who would you know they they all all kind of use it as stuff do all all sorts of fucked up stuff to China Um, I don't know how that could work at a time when these loans are from a time when China was essentially being colonized and not even, they're not even the same government that they are right now. Like they're not even close to the same government before they were, I forget the name of the, of the government that was in place there, but um, the, I, I don't know how you transfer that over because it was a whole new communist regime that was built after world war two. Like how how do they they carry on the same debts? That's as the that's the internet. Like that's how does the, that how does that how does that work? Like so, I I, was, I don't know. So I mean, think about it. Like uh, as an example, like more more current example, um, uh, Germany, right? Uh, World War One owed money in restitutions after World War One, right? That was one government. Afterwards, the Nazis kicked that that government out, right? And they became their own government. And then they, they still accrued, they still held that, those debts. Of course, they refused to pay them, right? Because they were Nazis. Uh, but then after Well, they World felt War- that they were unfair. They felt that they right. felt the debts were unfair. And, their- and the, Weimar, the Weimar Republic was created because it, it was, it was a, it wasn't like a revolution took place in Germany from, from the, 
from the, the German Empire mm-hmm. to Germany post World War One, it was it was broken up by the Allies, right? Who but did they, that. but so that's the Weimar why Republic, the, the, the Weimar Republic had these legitimate. debts. The Weimar Republic had these debts from World War One, right? And they had to pay those debts, and that's what caused runaway inflation in the Weimar Republic, which ultimately, not ultimately, but was a major contributing factor to the rise of Nazism, specifically of, of Hitler. Um, you know, a lot of the sentiments that were growing around, oh, this debt, this debt, this debt, um, and Nazism happened, and World War II happened, and then after we removed Nazism, and, and then we, we broke up Germany into two countries, right? The, the West German and the East German countries. They still owed this debt from World War I and accrued a bunch of new debt, right? And now reunified Germany has very recently finished paying off a lot of that World War I debt and is paying and is continuing to pay off that World War II debt. So the question you were saying, like, how could China, who was a completely different government, how, why would they have to owe this debt? Well, then the question would be, why would Germany have to owe Nazi debt or Weimar Republic debt? So there's a completely I'm, different con- uh, government. So- Here's here's what my, my theory is. So here's here's this. this I'm speculating right now because I, I don't know the answer of this. But mm-hmm. um, he, here's what I would think. So um, it's because Germany was broken up by uh, outside forces that basically, you know, controlled th- that really pumped their foreign aid into them after World War Two. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of obliged to do what the allied powers, specifically the U.S., wanted them to do after world war ii um they lost the war you know china they didn't lose the war there was a civil war that happened that disposed the 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 former nationalist government that they had there uh which again was not a very powerful government and they were overthrown by communist government i so there wasn't like a outside external force that would it that would enforce those debts but i, I honestly don't know that's a good that's my, guess. That's my theory that's a good that's guess. guess that's a good guess but i think that would only really apply to when west germany and east germany were 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 not unified at the point that west germany and east germany unified they they cut those kind of like t- not cut ties but they they stopped being propped up by external forces and they they started being their own thing Right. And today, I think it's it's hard to say that, you know, the United States props up Germany. That's not the case. Maybe mil- militarily for sure. But like economically, hell no. Like they're doing their own thing. They're propping up the rest of Europe, if anything. Right. And nevertheless, they're still um, making good on those debts that they that they accrued in you know two or three governments past. Um, but, you know, this whole conversation has me thinking a wild thought, which is, you know, if what you postulate is true and you know only an internal you know coup of a government could basically reset debt then you know i guess the implication there is if we overthrow the government with like communism or something like that then do we just default on all that chinese debt well here's the thing (laughs) if you're if you're if you're lending to a country that that fails then you just shouldn't get your money back (laughs) yeah like that's kind of like my how i think like if you yeah, but, I mean, they didn't fail. China didn't fail. They, yeah. yeah, they did. They failed. The, the, the government failed, and a communist government took over. They're still around. That's defini- that's... The definition of failure is that the communist government takes over. <laughs> like, that's the definition of like a failed, yeah. almost a failed state. Like, yeah, fair, fair point. Uh, but I mean, like, they're a functioning state now, and it's the same communist state. But the, the debts were accrued before they went became communist. So. So they're just they're they're different states. Like China has been a million different states. Like they were China g- going. So let's back. just change states. They, they, they were separate for most. Like China, the, what do the we new got? Phenomenon of the People's Republic of China is uh-huh. like a new thing. Like uh-huh. they had always been divided. You know, like they were. You know, Hong Kong was part of Britain. Um, Taiwan wasn't. Well, I guess Taiwan still technically isn't. Um, it was broken up in like the ancient age. It was broken up into different kingdoms. Like the nation state of China was just like recently built. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. Very modern I hear what you're state. saying, but like that's that's not how international law works, or at least how I understand it from the reading of this article that I read. Evidently, 
according to international law, the the government that takes over a country, if a, if a country's government fails and it's superseded by another government, that government assumes the debts of the previous, and that's just how it works. Because it, you know, because I'm uh, if it doesn't work that way, then what I'm seeing is that you know we should just let's switch governments. <laughs> let's just what do we got thirty trillion in debt, right? Let's just switch governments. Let's just be a different government. We can switch back later, maybe, and then uh, that'll just reset our debt. I don't, I don't think, I don't think it works like that <laughs> because you'd have to essentially turn over every single politician, right? Yeah. Or they'd have to take no, let's new just roles. Do it. Yeah, just do you'd it. Have to, turn, you'd have to turn over all these departments and governments. Yep. It, let's do it. It's. I don't, I don't think anyone would be down for that. Pull I think the there's plug. Too, there's there's <laughs> enough interest. Uh, all right, we're gonna rip up the constitution. We're gonna we're going to you know, turn over everyone who's in power right now. Um, and we're just going to call us, you know, we'll, we'll call ourselves the Confederacy. I'm joking. <laughs> no, I mean, look, um, look, the point, the point I'm trying to make here is that if, if um, we're so concerned about debt that we owe China, China should be equally concerned about debt that they owe us. That's all I'm saying. And I think that's totally fair. Well, I have to get back to you on the question of how that debt works legally, but, I, you know, I'm I'm sure China has their lawyers that will take that up in, in an international court that will make the case that there's no way that debt can pass over. But I don't know. I I, I honestly don't know the the answer to this this question or or like every everything I'm saying right now is is mm-hmm. based off pure uh, just speculating how that works. But I, I mean, if they if they got it, this but, company, the Lewisburg, would probably be the most like the richest company on the planet like overnight well they're not going to get it of course not but i I like thinking about it 1.6 trillion dollars just crazy ass windfall but but i think the u.s's main concern with with uh defaulting is that it it will hurt the value of a dollar because less people would be interested to buy dollars if we knew that if, if there was the risk of defaulting on your own loans. Hey, that's, maybe, that's may, the issue. Maybe we, you know, play to the better, you know, angels of of all the other countries in the world and say, "Hey, we're defaulting on this on this Chinese debt because they did coronavirus." And this is this is how we get it to pay back and then everyone just agrees that like, "Oh, okay, cool." So everyone will basically back China up into a nuclear armed power into <laughs> a complete financial hole uh and ruin the state there that's gonna that's gonna work out really well i think that's, you think I china, think that's the you way that china i don't think china is going to react to that well yeah they are reacting china will be like well we have we have nuclear warheads like we'll protect ourselves and destroy a city like you don't think that they will there'll be some type of blowback if oh yeah definitely the entire world just defaulted on all their debts or agreed to conspire they conspire together to like bring down china's com- economy completely uh and destroy the country you don't think that a, Ch- a country like china that it's by by its own existence it, it exists to advance the the state power of china and it controls populace you don't think that they would like get back into a corner and, and react in a very harsh calculated manner I don't have to guess about. I don't have to guess about that. I know that's true. They they're writing up the plans to do it right now. I mean, we talked about it in the last episode. They're already like thinking about all options are on the table, up to and including military. And as I said earlier in in this episode, you know, they they're even doing some military drills to you know capture islands in the South China Sea. So you know, um, yeah, that that would absolutely happen. Well, you got to go back to World War Two, like. The reason why World War Two started was because of World War One. You know, Germany wouldn't have be, Germany got all screwed up in a nutshell because mm-hmm. of a lot of the a lot of the treatment of them after due to the Versailles Agreement, uh, the Treaty of Versailles. Right. So, I mean, all that debt that I would, they I would imagine created I would imagine runaway inflation. So it would create a very pissed off uh, part of the world, and we're talking about billions of people. Or a billion, over a billion people in that country, so yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's a, the smartest way to play that out. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not a smart way. I but... think, I think that businesses can do things like move their, they should move their uh, manufacturing plants out of China, or maybe 
put more plant if like if you're going to man, manufa- uh, manufacture products outside of of the U.S. or China, then do it maybe in like Vietnam or something like that, or Cambodia or some somebody. In, I, I I'm not for like the sweatshop atmosphere. I'm just saying that would be the that would be the reaction that would be more feasible, like moving your business outside of that area. Well, that's mainly the, because there's probably going to be some stigma that's associated as, as that, like, Oh, we don't want to get stuff from China. Yeah. I mean, that's, China. that's, that's kind of the, the, the talks on the street here. Uh, just read that like a Canadian, uh, uh, government heads are, are talking about repatriating a lot of their manufacturers and they're trying to work with the U S on, on doing the same, um, to like onshore their manufacturing, like bring it back to North America instead. Um, I think Mexico would be a really good candidate for that. Uh, I think that's like their prime target is is just ramp up production in Mexico. It would be cheaper to transport. And, you know, the labor is just, it's not as cheap as China, but, you know, it's cheaper than America or Canada. So I think that that'll probably be the more likely situation is that they'll probably repatriate a lot to Mexico. Uh, now that we have that new USMCA deal, uh, you know, that allows us to do some more free trade between our North American partners here. That'll, that'll probably be the case. And Vietnam does sound like a good option or at least uh, a similar option to China. But I feel like um, at this juncture, there's probably going to be a lot, like a lot of anti-Asian generally st- sentiments. Um, it's like swapping one for the other. I know they're, they're nothing well, alike and they're completely different, but like the, that's, that's how the, that's how the, these business folks work. You know, it's just like, you know they'll they'll get spooked at the idea of having like an uh like an offshore East Asian manufacturing hub when they can potentially figure out a way to do it here. Well, as far as I know, those those countries in Southeast Asia, in Indochina, mm-hmm. um, they did not really get hit that bad with coronavirus. Yeah, it's not about coronavirus specifically. It's about like you know they got burned doing offshore you know, manufacturing because they wanted to save a buck because it was cheaper to do it out there. And we realized very quickly that if some shit goes down outside of our, you know, territories when we're, when we're offshore manufacturing, that our supply chains get all fucked up and it really wrecks our economy, you know, and, you know, for better or for worse, I mean, not knocking Vietnam, but Vietnam is not as rich as China and, you know, if some shit went down in Vietnam, would they be able to respond well enough to keep up the logistics and the supply chains to to meet our demands? Probably not. You know, so if I'm a business exec and I'm just cutthroat about it, I'm thinking about ways to repatriate a lot of that manufacturing so that we don't have situations where any pandemic, it could be pandemic, it could be global warming, it could be fucking anything. You know, are is my supply chain safe from that, and I think that's I'm reading a lot of shit about people wanting to repatriate a lot of manufacturing. Yeah, and you know that you know that this isn't going to be the the big thing in everyone's mind is that it's like this is going to happen again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, it's like, like when this happens when this happens again, right? Uh, what do we, what do we do? It's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, it's going to be more than interesting. To see what happens in the next couple of months, mm-hmm. as far as um, what I'm what I'm interested in is seeing like what's going on in November and December when stew when stew when flu season starts back up to see when the stew like, season f- comes back up when when the stew is deep <laughs> when the flu season starts back up it's going to be compounding man if because COVID, we're still going to have COVID nineteen we still, is, we're still uh, going to have it for come, sure comes back because I mean I I've said this repeatedly man I don't know shit about fucking medical stuff um so uh, i would just imagine i I have zero clue if like COVID 19 dies in the summer like i hear shit all i read different sources and like two things will say the exactly different thing and i'll just be like i well i don't know i don't i'm not i don't know enough to be able to call people's bullshit or Mm -hmm. like under like to to know what I mean, like ind- independent of sources, like I know, you know, pretty. I'll basic, read like op-ed, basic like science, op-ed, like you know? op-ed stuff. So yeah, like... I try to I try to avoid like the op-eds because I don't want to get people's opinions. I want to look at the science, and all I know is that 
there are two factors that will that in my opinion will make sure that COVID sticks around for a little while. And one of it's going to be herd immunity. We're going to need 60 to 70 percent of people to get COVID in order for us to figure out, like create the antibodies in our body for us to have a massive amount of, of people to to have herd immunity, which is where enough people are immune to the disease. And, you know, it basically stops it from spreading because too many people have the antibodies so that but but to do that, you also <laughs> imagine, you know, we have what? 85,000 or so deaths in the United States. Can you imagine 60 to 70% of the country having COVID? Our death count would be ridiculous. So that's not an option for everyone just to get it, right? Because massive millions of people will die. So the, the alternative there is you get a vaccine, you make a vaccine. And nobody has a vaccine right now. And the most like liberal estimates on like how fast we can get a vaccine is like 18 months. So, you know, you just take those two things in, in stride and you, you know, kind of points to the fairly objective, you know, opinion that it's going to be around for a little while. And to your point, when the flu season comes around, it's just going to compound, right? And it'll become much harder to figure out, is this COVID or is this the flu? Or will they mutate into one COVID flu superbug, you know, which is also a possibility. Well, will they, will they, that would be super scary. Like Dude, now, it's it's, now COVID-19 is... Now the flu as well. It's both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, viruses mutate all the time. So, you know, that's that's why we always have to get a new vaccine for the flu because the flu literally mutates every year. And there's like new strains every year and we have to figure out, oh shit, here's the new strain. We got to get vaccinated for that strain. When, like a couple, about a month or two ago when this first started happening, uh, there was an episode, this before I think there was even a lockdown, I made a joke that, the it was um from it was it was a leftover facility from imperial japan mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. unit 741 right where they would do all these experiments and cross diseases and work on like bio war warfare technology uh-huh they were they were working on a i think they successfully did it they crossed ebola with smallpox like they're working on all this, like these, these Ebola weird pox. diseases, all these weird diseases that, um, they're, they were taking vicious diseases and, and, you know, mating them or right. merging them or whatever. I don't know how you fusing mate them. them. You, I have no fusing, idea. Do you mate diseases? <laughs> um, breed, do you breed them? I think breeding is, a, is the term. Uh, I don't know. And they were, they were breeding these diseases and they were doing some terrible stuff. Like they were, they were taking POWs and they were. They were infecting them with these diseases and they were doing a lot of stuff on like uh, the effects of hypothermia. So they were freezing people and like cutting off their limbs to test if they would feel pain, like just fuck, like really fucked up stuff that um, is like out of a out of a like a horror film. They actually there is like a famous movie, uh, which is a Chinese film called Unit 731. Um, that's about this that. uh that that's like very very graphic and i watched part of it for some reason and i regret it the scientists were given immunity the guys who were running it by the u.s so they weren't tried in in the in the tokyo uh in the tokyo war tribunals like they were given immunity because we wanted to pick their brains or like how did you do this hmm. but that happens a lot you know like there'll be some evil fucked up scientists and uh, opposing governments will get their hands on them and they'll be granted immunity for their, basically for their knowledge and, and brain. Well, I mean, it's the way that we have our space program. We basically took a bunch of like Nazi rocket scientists that were building and, you know, like intercontinental ballistic missiles. Werner von Braun, he was a Nazi and we stole him and we gave him immunity and we were like, Hey, can you make us a spaceship? <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was like, yeah, certainly I can make you a spaceship. Okay. Yeah. Naturally. Sure. I make spaceship. We will call it a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Hard air quotes. Yeah. Told you these things were smart. Yeah. Um, you ever, it's funny how Al Einstein, Einstein ended up in the U.S. when like things were getting really bad yep. with, with anti-Semitism. And he was on a book tour 
in the U.S. at that when things were really cracking down. He's like, I'm just gonna stay here. <laughs> I'm just like, back. And the U.S. is like, please, just yeah, like we'd love to have you stay. <laughs> can you make us a bomb? <laughs> yeah, can you make us a bomb? We might have to kill those guys soon. <laughs> um, so what's the deal with this, um, rocket attack? So there was a, a booster that almost hit New York City. Oh, yeah, that's a good story. Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, there's actually two really interesting space news um, that happened recently. Uh, and the the one that I want to talk about is China's because we were just talking about China's, but there's also a Russian story. So the first one is a Chinese booster rocket almost hit New York City. So there was this massive like 20-ton chunk of a failed rocket that um, China had in orbit. Basically, there was, you know, they, they launched a rocket into orbit this month. Uh, it was supposed to be like setting up, uh, like setting the stage for them to start sending pieces of a modular space station. And also because they're, they're trying to ramp up their space stuff. They want to go to the moon. They want to do a bunch of random things in space. And this rocket was intended to be like a test for, you know, uh, their liftoff capabilities. And what happened was something fucked up, something malfunctioned. There, it's China. You'll never find out exactly what happened, but all you need to know is that this massive thing uh, had an uncontrolled um, descent. That's called an uncontrolled descend, which is basically it fell. It fell from the fucking sky, uh, and then obviously when it's falling, like a, a lot of it like vaporizes in the atmosphere, but big big pieces of it don't. Um, and, uh, one piece was a 20 ton core stage. Uh, oh, actually that was the, the, the main piece that fell down, but there was this one, um, this one chunk of this core stage. Astronomers say that the piece that fell that lasted through the, um, atmosphere was 93 feet long and weighed 20 tons. And it's, it was just the most massive like thing. It was like a, this is just enormous and evidently if it had if it had re-entered into space uh into earth 15 minutes earlier it would have hit new york city because that was the that was the path that it was on it ended up um hitting the atlantic ocean off the coast of cote d'ivoire and apparently other like smaller pieces fell on cote d'ivoire um which uh is is a, a far west african country that's in on the on the coast of the atlantic ocean there um but uh yeah evidently you know according to the calculations that they ran just like by minutes new york city would have been hit so that's that's crazy do they know did they know where i guess that's too broad right like it just would have landed somewhere in new somewhere york city somewhere in the new york city metro area it would have landed that's that's Jesus. where that's where they put it imagine if that happened it would be like and it killed people it would, I mean, it would be... definitely kill people. It's New York City. <laughs> like, there's no area that, that it could hit and not kill people. It could hit in Central Park and kill mad people, especially now because everyone's there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it would have been devastating. It would have been devastating. Um, in, the re in the reaction. Oh, God. And, well. and it's a Chinese booster rocket. It's like, first you give us Corona, and now you hit, hit us with a fucking broken rocket. Like, come on. But China's especially been, in China's, New York in a, in the in the worst place in the world for Corona. Yeah, seriously, China is is seriously like reckless abandon for a lot of things, but specifically for their space program. Like, evidently they ignore guidelines on like launching from the coasts. You know, the reasons why we have like Cape Canaveral in Florida and shit like that um, is, or, or like Houston in in um, on the Gulf Coast is because when you launch a rocket, you know. I mean, with the exception of Elon Musk's rockets that land them land their damn selves, the booster rocket itself flies up into space, and when it runs out of fuel, it just falls back to the Earth, right? And you don't want that falling on people, right? You want it to land somewhere safely in the ocean where it won't kill anybody, you know, or destroy anything. And they consistently launch rockets, like, in, in the middle of the mainland, like, for fun. And like, there's been reports of like pieces of rocket debris from previous launches, like randomly hitting their own cities and and villages and shit. And they don't give a shit. Um, and they're putting up a lot into space. And this kind of brings up the next space news, which is you know Russia 
uh, kind of did a similar thing. They, they just uh, launched uh, a rocket and one of the tanks that they used to launch this rocket and they were putting a radio telescope into, into space, apparently vaporized. It like destroyed itself in space, but broke up into 65 chunks and those chunks are currently in orbit. <laughs> and this is like a problem uh, because space junk is a problem. Um, it's not clear what caused the breakup, um, but there was no evidence that it was because of a collision. Um, and this was an interesting point that I read. Apparently, the estimated cost that this one incident has it's going to increase the total mission costs of every new launch by five to ten percent. So this is hundreds of millions of dollars to send new uh, uh, satellites into geostationary orbit and also other low Earth orbit gear. And the reason why it, it these sixty five chunks of space junk are now going to make us make it more expensive to go to space is because now we have to spend money making air spacecrafts that are protected against space junk and making you know surveillance systems and tracking methods and also just like you know nudging satellites out of the way of the space junk um isn't is now what the movie gravity is about yes it is what the movie gravity is about and so if you've ever if you've not seen the movie gravity basically one you know, two you know satellites collide and and it causes this giant you know uh, uh, wasn't the Russian were, had something to do with the Russians like blowing up a satellite? Was it? I thought it was that they collided. Maybe it's been a while since I've seen this movie. In, in general, though, I, something in space blew up, right? I think they blew up a satellite, and then the debris from the sat from the explosion mm -hmm. was like in it, the, the American satellite was in orbit mm -hmm. where the debris was coming right and then so, that got hit and that exploded and then caused more space junk flying at tens of thousands of you know feet per second uh and then it's a pretty dope a, movie by the way yeah i caused a ridiculous chain reaction yeah that's a real ass thing and it just happened and now space is five to ten percent more expensive because of a shitty russian rocket fucking russians fucking russians ruining everything mm -hmm. all right um you want to talk about that main topic because we're we are yeah let's it. get into yeah i guess what we were planning on talking about for the majority of today <laughs> yeah. hopefully we can cover everything but um so uh israel palestine uh so most of you probably know that netanyahu secured approval for his annexation plan of the Jordan Valley. Uh, he did this with his new government partner, his new coalition partner, Benny Gantz. We haven't even really addressed that they formed uh, a the coalition government, government together, right? Co a coalition government together, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of funny when you kind of play, when you kind of look at it in hindsight, because Netanyahu had all these corruption charges against them. Um, he was indicted, you know, <laughs> for taking cigars and perfume and fur and and, uh, and fur coats for his wife. And it, it was pretty. It seemed pretty clear that this guy was doing a lot of shady shit. Yeah. And um, I mean, he's a he's a lifetime of career in politics. I think he's the longest uh, serving, right? Right now. Well, he served. He served multiple at multiple times. So he is the most popular politician in Israel, um, and he was. He's he's also kind of like an iron horse when it comes to politics. I don't think Benny Gantz was ready to go after you know to go election after election after election after election mm -hmm. i don't think he had the political stamina to keep up with benjamin netanyahu because benjamin he netanyahu lives for this like for this dirty in the in the ground politics type shit like yeah. he lives for it. and benny gantz is a military guy right I mean, everyone's a military guy in Israel because it's compulsory service. Right. But like, he's like a real—he's a general. He's a real so, military guy. <laughs> um, 
So I don't think he had the stamina to keep up with them, especially that there was a state of emergency with COVID-19. So he kind of just kind of waved the white flag and said in society to form a government with them. But needless to say, I don't think there's way too there's too many differences between Gantz and Netanyahu. Uh, at, at the very least, as far as like what their policies would be regarding their neighbors and, and Palestine and all that, because Benny Gantz is, is endorsing the annexation. And it's important to note that this follows a series of events uh, from the White House, such as Trump's endorsement of uh, Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights back in March 2019, mm-hmm. as well as them recognizing Jerusalem as, as the capital. Um, and moving this the, is, and moving the embassy. Yeah, I recognize it, and uh, it moving the embassy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, needless to say, like it's it's illegal, it's illegal under international law. Right. But at this point, no one really cares. I mean, it's kind of a joke at this point. I but mean, I, it is illegal. I care. <laughs> I mean, most people care, yeah. but you know, the people making the decisions don't really give a shit. Yeah. Um, it's a it violates uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention, and they're changing the status of land in the West Bank. Uh, from that was that from what was occupied since 1967 to sovereign territory. Right. So. They're they're taking land. They're changing it from occupied territory to part of part of Israel. Right. Um, you know, it goes against UN authority to do that because people are supposed to. If you're going to transfer territory like that, there has to be some type of consent from the people. Right. But it doesn't. It doesn't really matter in international law. I mean, the Israelis can pretty much do what they want with. Um, it, and it's kind of funny that they're playing this game with uh, the U.S. because, like, the only condition they really had was that they had to get approval from the U.S. And the U.S. kind of threw the ball back to them. They're like, "Yeah, you can do it. Like, we'll just we just get we just got to get a uh, approval from the Trump administration." Of course, Trump's going to be like, "Yeah, you know, whatever, whatever. It's your decision. It's your call." So once they got that seal of approval, but. Um, Pompeo apparently was in Israel, uh, over the past couple of days or, or yesterday he went over there and he was telling him to keep that, do it slowly. And I guess the, I guess the, uh, the logic there is that it's going to bring a lot of negative attention. So don't do it in some like military sweep, but what are your, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, full disclosure for those that don't know, I'm half Palestinian, so I don't love the idea. Um, but um, just like outside of the identity politics here, you know, it's just, it's clearly in, in defiance of international law. And it's also just like, not, not a great idea. Um, so evidently what they're trying to do here is, is, uh, they're trying to go after area C. Um, and for those folks that don't know, you know, the, the West bank, uh, the occupied territory, um, occupied Palestinian territory that Israel holds right now is broken up into three main sections, area A, B, and C. And each of those sections have distinct sets of control uh, where, you know, I think it's A is like completely under Palestinian control. B is like kind of half Palestinian, half Israeli, you know, cooperation control. And then C, which is the largest one, it's 60% of the West Bank, um, is under total Israeli control. Uh, And this includes the Jordan Valley um, and, you know, right there on the on the sea so you know um by doing this they're basically saying uh that they're going to annul the military command order number 58 from 1967 uh that that's been in in effect in the west bank since 1967 and basically this order states that um the state who is in legal possession of the abandoned asset in this case the palestinian land would have to give it back to the owner, the Palestinian, uh, whenever they return. And it also specifically says that the state is not permitted to allocate the land for any settlement, which they've been doing for years anyway. Um, but what they're trying to do is, and this just happened in there in the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, well, not just happened, it was in 2014, 
what I'm talking about. In 2014, an expanded panel of, of uh, Supreme Court justices in Israel basically said um, that stuff in East Jerusalem, the you know the annexation of East Jerusalem, that's abandoned property. They they're using their abandoned property law to say that Palestinians who fled or left the West Bank or who were expelled in many cases, they don't have claim to it because it's it's abandoned property. We can take it. We can do whatever we want with it. And so they're trying to use this law. They just left. They just left. They just left. They just left. They're not coming back. They're not using it. It's ours. They went to go fight with the Arabs to come back and kill us all. Right. Um, Well, I mean. That's kind of the justification. Like they left to go join with Jordan, the king of Jordan, to come back and destroy Israel. You know, Um, I mean, maybe some of them did. Maybe that's possible for like some small fraction of them. But the majority of these folks ended up just going to fucking refugee camps and living in terrible situations. And whole generations of people are now stuck in refugee camps in places like Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and a bunch of other places. And they're second class citizens in most of those countries and they can't naturalize to them and they can't come back. And now they're just basically in, in a fucking limbo. Anyway, that's a side note. The point, though, is that they're trying to ch- use this abandoned property law from 2014 to apply to, to, you know, this West Bank situation. And what they can do is basically say, yep, you left. It's abandoned property. It's ours now. We can do whatever we want with it. Um, and that's not great. That's not great. I mean, it's it's already pretty Swiss cheesy right now um, for the folks that don't, don't already know. And I actually have an interesting picture. I saw this on Reddit. Um, And I kind of want to pull this up real fast and just talk about it because uh, for those folks that are listening, you're going to have to Google it or watch us on YouTube. But uh, every time we we end up talking about the West Bank and like how fucked up of a situation it is, it's really important to to remember, like, what does the map actually look like? Um, And I found this interesting comparison um, to the map pre and post 67, um, but also comparing it to something very, very close to home.
what is now the Israel proper, uh, between 750,000 to a million Palestinians were expelled from the area. Um, over four, four million million acres of Palestinian land was expro- uh, appropriated after the creation of Israel. Over 400 Palestinian towns and cities were destroyed. And right now, I mean, there's well over 7 million Palestinian refugees worldwide. And those are in Arab, local Arab countries uh, and places like Gaza as well uh, are considered refugees. Now, the immediate cause of, you know, the war that took place in 1947 and 1948, uh, the war that led to the creation of Israel and then obviously Israel's war with their neighbors such as Syria, Iraq, and Jordan, and Egypt, was the 1947 UN resolution to partition Palestine. And what essentially happened is that there were two narratives that, I mean, there's two narratives that most people see this, see this conflict as. And, you know, the Arab version is that the Zionists came from nowhere and then really just attacked the, you know, the, the peaceful, loving Arab population and then drove them out of their country. And then the Zionist interpretation of that is that they accepted the UN's compromise plan, but the Arabs rejected it and started the war. And, you know, they were convinced by the the Arab, the Palestinians, they were convinced by other Arab states like Jordan and Egypt to and Syria to leave their homes in order to return with the victorious Arab armies when they eventually won the war. Um, so th- like those are like the two narratives that you'll yet you'll you'll see. Mm-hmm. Now truthfully, uh, you can you can find yourself, somewhere in the middle when thinking about these things. Yep. But in British governed Palestine at the end of 1947, there were about 1.2 million Arabs and around 600,000 Jews. And they had previously lived relatively close. You know, they, they lived in close proximity of each other, uh, but they lived in separate neighborhoods. So, Primarily, they lived in cities like Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Jaffa, Mm -hmm. and in neighboring villages as well. I mean, we're not talking about a really big space. And the war that eventually breaks out, it kind of, or the Nakba, or the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, it it kind of takes place in two stages. There are basically two wars that were on top of each other that is is kind of thrown into one war when people talk about it. the first stage was was really from November of 1947 until the withdrawal of, of British forces and the establishment of Israel on May 15, 1948. And the second phase lasted from that May until early 1949. And this was the war between Egypt, uh, excuse, uh, between Israel and its neighbors. Um, when the war started, the Palestinians had the numbers but they were poorly organized. So, you know, the Jewish side had Zionist paramilitary groups like the Haganah and and Ergun, which were terrorist groups. Like, they were murdering both Jews and Arab civilians along with British officers, and they would do things like like bombings, car bombings, uh, the King David Hotel, blowing up boats with uh, Jews leaving the comp- leaving the country because they wanted to maintain a demographic. Uh, they would target British officers, British commands a lot. And the reason for the resentment was because of restrictions placed off Jewish immigration from Europe in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. So what ended up... Are you following me right now? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So... I just want to make sure I'm not rambling too much. No, you're good. So the Zionist side, they started removing Arab villages along major roads. And they started removing them from the major population centers. So at that time, it was like Jaffa and Haifa and all the Arab neighborhoods in in West Jerusalem. And they bombed Jaffa. They bombed with mortars. And they, they completely emptied that city that had well it had tens of thousands of people living there. 
And Jaffa was meant to be part of a stillborn Arab state that was designated in a 1947 partition plan. And the same thing happened to Haifa and, and, and West Jerusalem as well. So all the major population centers were essentially emptied during this war. And this was before the war, like the, you know, the war that we think of, you know, on, on Prager U, the, the war <laughs> starts, it's the war starts like right after Israel declares its independence, and then all of the crazy Muslim countries attack them because it's in their inherent blood to, right. uh, you know, hate infidels and stuff like that. Um, there was a whole war going on before that, that was, Largely a war of, with parallel, like a paramilitary with, group, right? Paramilitaries and mm-hmm. the Zionist side, which is way more organized than the Palestinian side. Um, so most of the, the Palestinian population, they became refugees and they lost their homes, their livelihood. And when you know, it's funny when we, apparently when West Jerusalem fell, they called up. They tried getting in touch with King Abdullah, who was the king of Jordan at the time. Right. And they were telling him, like, we, we need help. Like, we need our Arab brother and to come in and save, like, the, to come in and, and support us. And they were like, "That's you're lying. This is not actually happening. Like, Bruno, you're not using West Jerusalem. Fake news. <laughs> fake, fake news. <laughs> so, um, it, like, in a lot of these towns and villages, people started to leave because Arabs were being massacred in a right. lot of them. So, so, they, so they actually, we're talking about you're saying they actually did reach out though, right? To get help, to get support, and they just didn't get it. Yeah. Initially. I think a lot. I think the governments, the Arab governments that invaded, uh, that invaded Israel, they weren't doing it for any altruistic reason. They were doing it for their own political reasons and their own land grabs as well. Like there, there's really no good guys in this, but it, it's important to note that like a lot of these villagers, like there was there was pretty fucked up things that happened to him like you know, the famous the, the famous massacre that some people who who looked you know who've looked into it probably know the uh Dair Yassin massacre and mm-hmm. that's when the Ergun and Haganah they slaughtered 167 civilians and a lot of them were women and children and they went and they killed every single male in the village uh and this was a really messy process it wasn't like a straightforward one like it changed from month to month and and this like exodus of, of people uh, or cleansing of people, however you want to word it. It was, it was, I don't think, I don't, this is just my perception. I don't think it was like some systematic uh, at first, at least, I don't think it was like a systematic cleansing. I think it was just on a case by case basis. A lot of it had to do with military circumstances of removing air population centers for major roads. Mm-hmm. And, there are some areas in Israel that are predominantly Arab still. So like Nazareth, for example, is right. an Arab village in Israel. And the reason why is because the, the, the command, the, the Jewish commander uh, who was occupying Nazareth, he accepted the, the surrender terms right. and refused to kick the people out of the village. So because it really depended on the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they surrendered. So I think it depended on just whatever circumstance as far as like, who the battlefield commander was or, or really whatever. Now, based off my perception, when it first started, I think a lot of these, a lot of Palestinians were, were booted out of their home at first because of the military necessity. However, there can't be an Israel without a Jewish majority. It just doesn't work. So you can't, you can't, it has to be a preconceived wish for the Palestinians to go away. And then after May 15th in 1948, the day after Israel declared independence, um, it became political, politically accepted to remove Palestinians after they were invaded. So units like would it, they would be ordered to shoot Arabs on site who were coming back to you know their their villages. And what happened was that after Israel won the war masses of Jew, like really large waves of Jewish refugees from Europe, survivors of the Holocaust, right. they flooded the country and filled the places left by the Arabs. And like, you know, like what the, what's like the tragedy is though, is that I think there's like kind of two major tragedies right here. So at one, the first tragedy is that this was normal at the time. 
So this happened only a few years after the mass expulsion of of Germans from Poland and Czechoslovakia and in the the Baltic states. So this was like a normal thing that happened, like mass migrations of humans are being expelled or kicked out of countries. The second tragedy to me is that, you know, it was a... It, trying to word this correct, word this in, in like a in a good way. It was a brutalized group of people who were given land at the expense of another brutalized group, which is like the real fucked up. Like I understand the need to create Israel or the want and desire to create Israel and like how Zionism started. But the tragedy is that it took place at the expense of millions of people in the Middle East. Right. Because they weren't forcibly – they were forcibly cleansed out of their – like off their land. Right. And that's the political reality that we live in. I don't blame people from waves of immigration coming into, into Israel. Right, because they were to, fleeing their own demons themselves, yeah. Like, I don't blame them. I don't think it's like, I don't think it was necessarily evil. However, at the end of the day, like, you got to call a spade a spade. I mean, they couldn't Israel find a way to coexist is with Jewish is the yeah. Jewish state. It's not the state for people who want to flee their homes from a, from a person. They want to flee from persecution. It's the Jewish state. So, that, I mean, that's really what it is. I know what you have any, do you have any notes? I, was, I mean, I was just going to say that, that, you know, from that point, it's, they couldn't figure a way to coexist, you know, with the Arab populations there, whether because it was cultural differences or the like a Zionistic desire to, to make, you know, a Jewish only homeland. Um, but regardless of which way that you want to look at it there was at the time no way for this to coincide and have and not be to the detriment of the arabs that live there and you know you can point out a lot of the things that arabs did that were wrong you know you can point to the invasions of of external arab countries into israel but you know like you said, there was a lot of stuff that, that happened leading up to it. And what's tough about this particular situation is that, you know, there's always something that came before, right? So, you know, before the Nakba, there was, you know, the, uh, the, the paramilitary groups that you talked about, you know, before that, there was I mean, before, something before, else. Before that was like something else. Like an all-out war you know? took place. You know? Before an all-out war took place, there was a lot of tick-for-tack type stuff going oh, on, yeah. like, you know, someone's murdered, there's a revenge murder, then there's a revenge hanging, then, you know, from the revenge hanging, there's like another murder, and then the British police got involved mm-hmm. uh, and hung the people who did that. It was a lot of that type of stuff going on, like a lot of like constant low-level violence between two ethnic groups or two or two groups. And, you know, both felt, if you, if you go to uh, Palestine or if you hear Palestinians talk and like, in Gaza or, or the West Bank or just any pissed off Palestinian, if you interview them, if you see interviews of them, you know there's kind of like a perception that they are, vi- they're violent because of Islam. Like Islam, it gives them a, a, um, a pass, a preconceived, a preconceived bigotry towards Israeli Jews that could not be like controlled and it's in their it's in their ideological nature to hate them if you hear them talk they talk like they're a bunch of of uh of southerners or texans like this is our our land like this is our it's not because of religion religious tensions like what people don't understand is that there were jews living in israel in, in palestine way before i mean there was always Jews living in Palestine, even when the Ottoman Ottoman Empire controlled that area. Mm-hmm. There was always Orthodox communities that lived there, right. and they were mainly not that. They were they were mainly anti-Zionist. There were a lot of Sephardic Jews, 
there was a lot of Jew, there was a lot of Middle Eastern Native Jews, and they were part of the indigenous population there. I mean, there's there's Jews everywhere in the Middle East. So I, I just when the justification comes down to uh, you know the land is given to you by a ordained God, like you know you're basing your claim from the land from a biblical story that may that other people may not believe. It kind of doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It's not. Doesn't hold up in court that uh, God gave you that land. I mean, it's re- it's really hard to 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 get across that point without, you know, without pissing a couple people off. But it's kind of true, you know. It's it's. I mean, God's not a real estate agent, but not all people, not all Zionists are religious. You know, like a, most of the most of the Zionists in the eight, in the nineteenth century were secular. They were doing it more as like a national homeland. So right. like, you know, like nationalism was growing in that time. And I think the like Zionism took the identity of more of like the Central European, Eastern European level of nationalism, which was a little bit more ethnic than like civic, you know, in, in France and Britain. There is more of a wave of of like civic nationalism, where you know anyone could be a French person if they speak the language and they and they're in the culture. In Germany, there was like you know these folklore of tracing your ancestors back to uh, Vikings and shit. <laughs> yeah, back to the Teutonic Knights and stuff like mm-hmm. that when they were slaying dragons. Like, <laughs> in, like in Serbia is a really good example. Like Serbia. Uh, like prior to the outbreak of World War One, had this like pseudo, uh, nat- like the pseudo historical vision of like the empire, the, this the Serbian Empire, which controlled all the Balkans and any place that a Serbian Orthodox Church touched would be considered Serbia. Right. And that type of nationalism was very toxic. And eventually led to some really bad governments that took place. And these really bad governments were part of the – was one of the main matches that lit off the the powder keg of World War I. Uh, I think unfortunately Zionism took a lot of those characteristics as a uh, – there's like an obsession with tracing your roots back to – a like there's like an obsession of creating like a linear origin story. So in order to do that, you had to kind of tie your origins to this piece of land to create like a linear origin story that, you know, this is our natural homeland and that we belong there type of thing. Right. And I think that's why it was attractive to uh, secular Jews. Or yeah. how it how it how it spread out to secular Jews. But again, like a lot the of, desire a lot of to create, were... the, the desire to create like a like a Jewish homeland, you know, whether it came from, you know, an Orthodox or a secular, you know, whether it came from a religious or a secular, you know, standing point, the desire to create a country that was an ethno state, what what amounts to an ethno state, um, came at the cost of the the Arab Palestinians that lived there at the time and you know and it still does now yeah and it kind of bringing it back to what's going on right now and um i think you know when it comes to the displaced palestinians from the jordan valley i think you know the, the current israeli government has basically perfected this concept of abandoned property and they're using this as the pretext to um I guess, like finish the job, you know? Um, and, you know, these, these settlements, you know, basically they've, they've been, it's, it's fucked up because like, on the one hand, I get upset about them building new settlements on what amounts to stolen land. And I get pretty upset with people who are okay with just living there. But at the same time, you know, the settlements that are being built, they've, what we're finding out now, uh, I read one thing on on that the comptroller 
uh, back in 2005, you know, figured out that, you know, the Israeli government had been allocating thousands of, of like acres of land that were owned by people who were displaced, you know, to other settlers. And oftentimes they weren't informing, you know, uh, the buyers of the homes or the plot of land uh, or the banks uh, that were providing them with the loans that that this was land theft. You know, they weren't telling them like, hey, this land once belonged to, you know, Ahmed, the Palestinian who fled to Jordan. They were just saying, hey, we have a plot of land to sell. Would you like it? And then they take it um, and they weren't properly informing them of it. So it was, it was kind of propagating this this myth. I don't think, you know, I, I think most most people would feel uneasy about uh, settling in land that should belong to someone else and that might have, you know, shady legal uh, uh, ramifications. But they conveniently l omitted that information for a lot. And there was a uh, famous uh, situation, I'm forgetting the guy's name, but uh, he his father owned a piece of land and was expelled during the 67 uh, uh, Nakba and they fled to Jordan. They naturalized. His kid basically grew up in Jordan and kind of rose the ranks and you know became like a politician there. He was uh, in their cabinet and then later finds out that the land that was supposed to be his father's had been sold for a settlement and he ended up like suing for the land. Um, and so a another kind of not so nice thing that's happening right now is what they're doing to prevent these situations what the israeli government is doing to prevent these situations is that the civil administration prepared like a blacklist of something like 2000 palestinians whose land was in that jordan valley uh and whose land was ha basically handed over to settlers so by blacklisting them it's saying that they can't come back to the country and they'll cite like, you know, security reasons, security considerations. That's the reason why you can't come. Um, and this would prevent them from coming for any reason. So whether it's family reunification, short visits, you know, business reasons, any, any really any reason. And so what we have is uh, a situation where the Israeli Supreme Court is saying that you can effectively take over land that you're in occupation of and call it abandoned property the state then decides to give it to a mortgage bank or something like that and they and they don't necessarily tell that that bank or that settler that this is actually land that was once owned by a palestinian who's a refugee and it's not legally owned by them under international law so they don't tell them that and then the settler or the bank buys it and they flip it they build a settlement on it they build a home on it they go move in and live there right they start their communities there and the people who own that land get blacklisted from coming back so that they can't legally pursue their land again it's theft it's theft is what it is and i don't necessarily blame the settlers themselves but you know i definitely think that you know the practices that they're doing and the kind of loopholes that they're extorting to get this done is 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 i think reprehensible it's 100 percent theft it's it's 100 percent theft and it's destruction of a lot of private property as well mm -hmm. uh it, what's interesting though is that a lot of conservative uh orthodox zionists have actually disagreed with this move to do this right. to to annex this land mm -hmm. And there is this article that's been going around the New York Times that's been pretty popular or it's been it's been circulating. And the title of it's called uh, Israel annexation would hurt Israel. Uh, Israel annexation would hurt Israel. So the opening statement, I have it up. I just I grabbed like some some just interesting lines from this article. And it starts out as. I'm not someone who frets over the Israel, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. In my view, the Palestinians long ago would have enjoyed self-rule had they stopped murdering Israelis. 
I ignore the Clinton parameters, the former president's compromise formula to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict two decades ago. Contrarily, I do encourage Israeli steps that signal the Palestinians that the conflict is over and they lost. I don't understand how much more you can... <laughs> I just love the wording that the conflict is over and they lost. Hmm. I don't I don't think there could be anything more more clear that the Palestinians lost. Right. It's like winning a football game, you know, 42 to nothing. And like, we got to show them that they like, yeah, of course they lost. Right. They're being occupied. We're going to take their helmets like, to show else, them that they lost. Like, what else would signal that they lost? Right. The fact that there's somebody like going in at their homes and like taking their uncle and throwing them in jail at night <laughs> routinely. Like, um, and in his article, it's interesting because he gives six reasons why it's a bad idea. And, and it's like in the conservative uh, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons was that President Trump would erupt in fury at Israel for unilaterally taking that step. Mm, I don't believe that. No. no Are you kidding me? That. Are you kidding me? Donald Trump is the most pro-Israel American president probably ever at this point. Yeah. Besides maybe... Lyndon B. Johnson, like, I don't think I'm you can not, think, not I don't, even, I, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson didn't move the embassy to, from Tel Aviv to, <laughs> to Jerusalem. So Lyndon B. Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson was very, very, uh, close with his Israel, um, him and him, and George Bush and, um, and George Bush, the, uh, the, the, the latter George W. Bush, yeah. the, the lesser, the lesser. Yeah. Okay. George H. W. Bush actually used to stand up to him. Um, not, not George. Well, not so, up. Well, George. Well, the thing is though is that like the, the wars, of course, like the Iraq War. Uh, you can throw that on there. But George W. Bush actually, um, he made them move settlements out of Gaza. So there's that mm -hmm. at least. Like there, he there's some things that he did. I, I Donald Trump kind of does everything that. Benjamin Netanyahu request of him, you know, like, yeah. Hey, this election coming up. Can you, uh, can you, uh, say that, can you, can you recognize our annexation of the Golan Heights? It's kind of like that type of thing. Yeah, sure. Whatever. So I don't think, I don't think like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I don't think Donald Trump would erupt in fury at anything. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Um, the second reason would be it would hurt Israel's relationship with Joe Biden. And the Democrats. It would hurt the relationship of Joe Biden and the Democrats. To do no, this. no, no. Sorry, I worded that wrong. It would hurt Israel's relationship with Joe Biden if, if he became that. president. Yeah. I mean, I don't really think he's going to be Joe president. Biden, so. Joe Biden said he opposed it. He opposed the annexation. Yeah, I know, but like, but I just don't think he'll be president. So I don't think that. <laughs> I don't think, think that matters. President? I don't know. I don't have a lot of faith. To be very honest, really, yeah. I thought you would. No, I'm starting to think the opposite. I, I'm actually thinking that he will win at this point. Really, I mean, like this coronavirus thing changes a whole lot of stuff, but he's got some fucking skeletons, man. And he wasn't. He was never my first choice. So he he was he was um, he's a hard man to back. I'm just saying. I think I think Joe Biden is incredibly creepy, and I'm very turned off how he grabs uh, people, especially children. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tara Reid thing. This is like a whole other can of worms, but I'm not – I'm kind of like the, – the evidence I don't think is 100 percent. I don't think it's like slam shut case, yeah, 100 percent yet um, with the Tara Reid allegations. I don't think it's 100 percent credible at this point, but that's just a different story for another day. Yeah. Um, so – the other reason, the third reason was it would piss off Israeli Gulf allies. Okay, that's fair. And for re residents in the West Bank would start a new Antifada. Mm, which I don't know if they have enough organizing power to do it. Or weapons. I just don't. Maybe, maybe it's a possibility. I don't think I don't I don't think that would happen. To be completely honest. I honestly don't think it would happen just from for logistical reasons, you know, like like I just showed yeah. the, the map, you know, like people in the West Bank, like 
it's hard to organize. You know, a lot of those communities you can't, you cannot freely travel between. So they would have to remotely organize an antifada to happen simultaneously all over. And, you know, Israel's got like, like a wall around most of their settlements, most of the Palestinian areas that is, that makes the Berlin wall look like a fucking fence, like a white picket fence, you know? So I, and the con and the consequences would be so, it so would be heavy. dire. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Israel is not afraid to use like show use of force against uh, Palestinians at all. Like, well, they, they'll, they'll a hundred percent hit them with, with, you know, F 16s immediately. Like immediately. Well, yeah, I, I know. And the fifth reason it would alienate the Israeli left, mm. which is a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Haret, I, I've been, I read a lot of Haaretz. Yeah. It's one of the newspapers I'm subscribed. I pay for. Mm -hmm. And, um, Haaretz, uh, has been covering this pretty, pretty well. Yep. And they're kind of like the Israeli center left paper. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, I think it would possibly alienate some of their more uh, left wing parties that have Arab membership and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I but, don't, I don't really know what the distribution is of like the Israeli left. I don't, I don't know how many of them there. I are. I mean, there most of them are all the pretty much Zionist parties, but there is there is like an Israeli left that opposes like the settlement building mm -hmm. and and wants to build a two two state solution mm -hmm. uh, and all that. And here's the number six. Like, here's the one. I have to read this entire thing just to make sure that everyone knows I'm not taking this out of context. Uh, this article is the New York Times by the author is – I just want to say the name real quick so you guys can look it up because it's such a doozy, this last this last reason. I've been paraphrasing the rest. You know, there's this is a whole article, but this is the final reason. S Annexation would be would likely would be likely to make more Palestinian Palestinians. Blah, sorry, I got marbles in my mouth. Let me read it over. Annexation would be likely to make more Palestinians eligible to become citizens of Israel. That would be a profound mistake since its Arab citizens constitute what I believe is the ultimate enemy of Israel's status as a Jewish state. The one that will be standing after the threats posed by Iran and Gaza have been dealt with. Citizens of Israel, unlike external enemies, cannot be defeated. Their allegiance must be won over, and the larger their number, the harder that becomes. So, what do you think about? Hold on, let me let me make sure I understood that. They're saying that they shouldn't annex the West Bank because if they do then the people who live there that are Arabs will become Israeli citizens. More likely to become Israeli okay, citizens. More likely to become Arab citizens. Well, I guess what I he's mean, anticipating Israeli is an citizens, increase. Uh, Israeli citizens. Right. The Arabs there are more likely to get Arab, uh, Israeli citizenship, right. like the you know the Bedouin towns that are still, because there's still right. a large demographic of Arabs right. in, who are Israeli citizens. Like, right. You got to take he, note of that. What he's, saying, what he's saying is like it'll increase the demographic of Arab israeli citizens by doing this and that's a problem because you can't you can't win their allegiance over because they're arab just by by the fact that they're arab i mean are, do, you, do you like am i am i like you're reading it correctly that's exactly what he said it's it's like kind of overtly racist well honestly i'm just gonna be blunt like it's it is racist. Like that is that's a racist statement. Like I hope everyone understands that this when we talk about these issues, we're not applying anything to, to like we're not collectively condemning Jewish people at all. Like that right. is we don't do that. We're not into that. We're not about you know hating on people for religion or ethnicity or anything like that. It's not about that. We're just trying to talk about a subject that. Uh, for a lot of people, it's very hard to talk about. So I hope you bear with us. And, you know, if you have some really strong partisan or uh, view of it, at least have an open mind. But 
Zionism has a lot of racist tendencies in it. Like, to preserve a Jewish state, you need to maintain a demographic of predominantly Jews. That's why marriages in Israel are only recognized if they're Jewish marriages. You know, it's like, I've been in debates with people about Israel and um, something that will commonly come up will be like, well, where else, and you know, Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East will be the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where else can gays, you know, where can there, where, where else can there be gays or there, where else is there gay marriage in the Middle East? And I'm like, well, not in Israel. <laughs> like there's no gay marriage in Israel. Like <laughs> there's only marriage between a man and a woman because there's, there's no civil marriage. It's only, re there's only religious marriage there. So you can't get married in Israel to an Arab person if you're Jewish. I was reading this article from this from this girl who was a social worker in Israel who had moved there, I think when she was like 16, 17 years old, um, and she met an Arab guy, and they had to move because they wanted to get married. And I was just like, that's not normal. <laughs> like that's not that's not li liberal right. or, and I'm speaking in the sense of like. That's not like what you would think a, a modern Western society would would be like. Um, right. There like you is can hold your opinions a, on, on whether or not gay people should get married, but I think it's pretty common in Western in Western countries that that's just allowed. It's just like you can't tout these things like, oh, it's like so progressive there and stuff compared to the rest of the Middle East where they're just – they're back – they're basically living in the 14th century when there's still those practices in, those, in, in Israel itself. And whatever you think about, like I honestly think that there, sh there should only be – there should not be civil marriage because of my you know, libertarian views, but that's besides the point. Like, I don't believe that there should be discrimination against it. Because there should be any uh, state enforced dis discrimination uh, between people uh, signing a contract with each other. But in this case, there is a clear incentive to maintain the demographic majority because in Israel's point of view, about 20% of Israel is Arab or, you know, Bedouin tribes uh, or, you know, leftovers from the Nakba or whatever. Um, surrounding them are, you have Gaza, which is the most densely populated on earth, place on earth. Then you have the West Bank and then all of your neighbors are predominantly Muslim countries. They have an interest, like they don't want the demographic shift to change. They don't want Israel to become dominated by Arabs. And the scariest thing is for them is that Arabs have a lot more kids. And they do. They have a lot more kids. So easily, if 50 years from now, there could be a major demographic swing. And that's why, Just in this natural point of view, too. that they don't want Arabs to become citizens of Israel because they don't want the society to change. And that like, is, that is a really day, weird but but interesting way to avoid a total land grab in the West Bank. Just like keep pressing that. It's like if you do this, you guarantee that your demographics change in 20 years. Well, there's areas that have been talked about that Netanyahu has talked about, like on the on the border of uh, the West Bank. That they're going to get back Israel proper. That they want to get back yeah. to, you know, kind of to get rid of the the Israeli citizenship yeah. there of Arabs. Yeah, but those people don't, don't think... want to be. They don't want to live in a Palestinian state. They live in Israel because they want to live in Israel. Yeah, because Israel is safer. Like, right, and it's got more it's, opportunity. It's, it's safer, yeah. and there's more opportunity. Of course, you'd rather live in Israel. It's like. Would you rather live in America or Mexico? America, for sure. America. Does Mexico blow up countries in the Middle East? No. no. Mexico doesn't do like that type of fucked up foreign policy stuff. Yeah, they got some. But I still rather live in America because America's safer and better. Like it's, yeah, it's way safer, safer and better. Yeah. Um. It's. 
I hope people just listen to this with an open mind when we talk about these subjects because I I have a lot of friends who are Zionist, um, and I debate them a lot. And I think I get to them sometimes when I bring up some of my points. However, uh, you uh, – actually, the majority of my friends are Zionist because I come from a pretty – my family is uh, pretty much mostly Zionist. I come from a conservative family. So uh, for me, this was – I'm kind of like a black sheep when it comes to Middle Eastern like opinions. Uh, but I, I just – I don't know how how else you look at this. Like, how else how else do you look at it? Like, there is a, a clear incentive um, to maintain to to make sure that the demographic doesn't switch. Like, what by what other if we if there was an incentive in the United States to maintain a white majority, like, what would you call that? Racism. <laughs> like, what would you call that? Like. We have a clear incentive to make sure that white people stay the majority in the United States of America. Uh, depending on who you ask, that's actually happening. But depending on who you ask, some people think you know that is going on in America. But I think in America, there's more emphasis on civil on, on civic civic nationalism, nationalism right. rather than ethnic mm -hmm. nationalism, like. Yeah, there's differences between people's backgrounds and the circumstances that are born in, and there's ethnic groups that are more likely to come from a background, but there's no lack of political rights for any group in America. Like, we both have the same rights, right. since even though we're different races. Right. Um, it's not like it there. Nope. And not then people are going to be Arabs have the right to vote. What are you talking about? They have the same rights. They go to Israeli hospitals and are and people are like, yeah, but like it's it's still, I mean, there's no constitution in Israel. You know, they don't have like a bill of rights type of thing to outline that. You know, they're right. they're it guarantees those protections yeah. for all people, right? But in the case of 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 the West Bank, I mean, Gaza is even a different. I don't I don't even want to go into Gaza. Gaza is a sad. Is it entirely okay. different? Like animal where it's 100 percent worse what's going on in gaza right. than what's going on in the west bank uh, and what's going on in the west bank is bad uh just I, I would recommend reading norman finkelstein's book about gaza and uh, or just max blumenthal's stuff on on gaza as well it's intense and it's very very depressing and it's and an extreme amount of violence that goes on there I mean, we can and go full circle. It's like F worse than New Jersey. You know? We're talking about F... Yeah, we're talking about F-15s versus rocks. Right. Type violence. Mm -hmm. Like, who wins? Oh, rock, paper, scissors. F-35 versus rock. Who wins? Oh, well, not F-35. More so like the F-15s or F-16s. Yeah. But who wins? Yeah. Tank versus rock. <laughs> oh, I chose tank again. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't have anything else to say about this unless you want to add anything. I don't either. Let's, let's switch subjects. You were talking about planes and and i want to close this out with a fun celebration uh a birthday if you will and uh actually technically tomorrow is henry's birthday so i just want to say happy birthday if you're listening to this online it's tomorrow but if you're listening to this in the podcast it's henry's birthday let them know you love them by liking sharing it's, it's and my, subscribing it's it's my birthday on may 15th so if you're listening to this on friday then it is i am well, i'm actually in 10 minutes, I will be turning 31. Oh, man. But it's another birthday this week, too. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of folks uh, that listen to Bro History love when we talk about military tech. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, really quickly, about a birthday that's kind of...
I So for those of you guys who are listening on the podcast here, just imagine the sound is brrrr. <laughs> it's got this, the most iconic sound ever. It's a dope plane. It flies, has real great stability at low speeds and low altitudes, which makes it a really great, great close air support uh, vehicle. And you know, now we're probably going to replace it with the F-35, which isn't very great for that particular role. But um, happy birthday, A-10 Warthog, and happy birthday, Henry. But first, happy birthday, A10 Warthog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm fucking tired. Um, all right. Thanks, guys, for joining today. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, make sure that you rate and review the show. Uh, we are now planning on releasing our episodes on Thursday. Uh, we're, we're recording them on Thursday and then releasing them on Friday mornings. So uh, stay tuned for that new schedule, at least for now. And, uh, yeah, if you want to see like the raw uncut version of the show, uh, go to the YouTube page, subscribe to it. Uh, we just started like kind of using it again and, uh, yeah, it's fun. So rate, review the podcast, uh, subscribe to the YouTube if you're interested and we will see you next week. Peace. Peace.